Welcome back to our class on reaching new levels of faith. This is class number four, where we're going to be talking about how do I graduate from imitating faith? Last class, we talked about what are the different levels of faith, and I taught you each of the five levels of faith and gave you a biblical example of each one. And I ask you to memorize these five levels of faith that are up on your screen right now starting at the bottom with imitating faith, affiliating faith, searching faith, solidifying faith, and mature faith. Need you to learn those because that's what we're going to be talking about in this class. So for this one, we're going to be talking about the bottom one, imitating faith. And as I explained already, imitating faith is essentially the faith of a child. A child just watches, they don't really understand, they just do what you do. And so I want to devote this class to talking about children. Children are so precious to me. You know, your child is essentially a replication of what he or she sees and hears in you. And so you as a parent, you're in a greater position than anyone on earth to influence your child to dedicate his or her life to Christ. I know that sounds a little scary, and it is. It's an awesome responsibility. Go ahead and clear back to the Old Testament. Actually, if you'll turn to the book of Deuteronomy in your Bible, please, with me, we see that God placed great emphasis on parents and what they're supposed to do for their children. In Deuteronomy chapter 11, starting in verse 18, you shall therefore impress these words of mine on your heart. So you start with your heart and on your soul. And you shall bind them as a sign on your hand, and they shall be as frontals on your forehead. Now, if you've probably seen pictures of uh, Jewish people today, and they will actually put scripture in a box, and they will tie it on their hand, and they'll actually tie it to their forehead really believe what God was saying here is that the Word of God should be influencing your hands, what you do, and your, your head, what you think. That the, you need to, to take the Word of God and start using it in a practical way. What you do and what you say and how you act and how you think and how you react. Because your children are watching this. Look what he says next here in verse 19. You shall teach them these words to your sons, talking to them when you sit in your house and when you walk along the road and when you lie down and when you rise up, you shall write them on the doorpost of your house and on your gates so that your days and the days of your sons may be multiplied on the land which the Lord swore to your fathers to give them as long as the heavens remain above the earth. We're to do this forever. As you are spending time with your children, walking along the road, when you go to bed, when you get up, all the time that you spend with your children, impress these words upon your children because you are impacting their faith. So let me give you some basic pointers of, of what we should do as parents. First of all, watch for opportunities to teach children moral values. You know, parenting, our responsibility as Christians is to instill Christian values in our children rather than merely controlling their personal conduct. I wish somebody would explain this to me many years ago because I thought my responsibility was just to control their conduct. Oh, you're doing this wrong? Here, do this right. No, that's really not what we're supposed to be doing as parents. We're supposed to be instilling these principles, these Christian values in our children. Look at the book of Proverbs chapter 3. Proverbs was written by Solomon, who was blessed to have a tremendously wonderful dad, King David, who loved his son very much and taught him many great things. In Proverbs chapter 3, Solomon writes this, starting in verse 1. My son, do not forget my teaching, but let your heart keep my commandments. Notice that, let your heart do that. Let your heart keep my commandments. For length of days and years of life and peace they will add to you. 
Do not let kindness and truth leave you. Bind them around your neck. Write them on the tablet of your heart so you will find favor and good repute in the sight of God and man. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and do not lean on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge Him and He will make your paths straight. That doesn't sound to me like just controlling personal conduct. This is the idea of parenting where we are putting the commandments of God before children, explaining to them. Don't just teach them right and wrong. Teach them why it is right or wrong. Obviously, age appropriate as they get older. Little children, you can't really explain everything that why this is right or wrong. But as they grow, watch for those opportunities to teach them more about why this is right and why this is right. Teach little ones to be participants in worship services rather than just spectators, if that. You know, I look around at children in worship service and they're really not part of the worship service. They're often just distracted. They are, are coloring and uh, playing on phones. Find ways to get your children involved in the worship service. and I. I think one of the best ideas I ever heard, I, I talked to a family who I really respected for the way that their children behaved in church. And I said, how do you do that? And they told me, he says, we practice church at home. We get them together. They're curious about the Lord's Supper. So we let them taste that. We get some unleavened bread and some fruit of the vine. And we say, this is what it is. And, and we help them to understand this is why we're doing it and why they don't need to do it. We, we tell them that, you know, you're, you're safe in the arms of God and until you get baptized, there's no need for you to take the supper. And uh, don't just tell your child, well, you can't do this till you get baptized because then they want to get baptized and they want to do it for the wrong reason. But explain to them, this is a time when you can still be thinking about the Lord. It is a time that we need to be serious and, and we need to be quiet and tell your children, this is important to mommy and daddy. And so it's not the time to ask, can I go to the bathroom or can I have a drink or something? This is a time that we just need to focus on the Lord. Explain that to them at home. Teach them at home the hymns. Encourage them to sing along when you're in worship. Children can sing and then encourage them when they do that. Explain the offering. Allow them to put money in the offering, preferably money that they have earned. Teach them how to set aside a portion and give that and teach them how to be cheerful givers. You know, if they're putting the money in and saying, boy, I could buy more candy if I, if I had that. Explain, yeah, you could buy more candy, but look at the good work that you're helping. Remember that missionary that we're supporting or, or this great work or that great work? You're giving this to the Lord. And this is, this is a, a wise thing to do, and it's such a blessing to get to do that. Encourage them to participate in all aspects of the worship service. Teach them to pray, to talk to God individually, to bow their little heads and to join in the public prayer and, and make it, you know, if you're sitting in worship service, hey, it's time to pray. Come here, come sit here and let's pray together and bow your head with them and, and pray. Encourage them to listen to the sermons and the Bible classes. You'd be amazed how much kids can get out of the, the Bible class. And as I've already explained, I, I have notes that I put in the bulletin for people to follow along. I do that primarily for the kids so they can write the words in and uh, the little kids will come up afterwards. They see, look, I got it all filled in. And that's just so wonderful. They hear, they learn, they talk to their parents afterwards. Say, hey, what did he mean when he said this? Encourage your kids to be particip participants, excuse me, participants of the worship service and not just spectators, just not like, well, this is something mom and dad do and not what I do. You want your kids involved. So watch for those opportunities. A second thing that is important to do is, is focus on learning rather than teaching. And what I mean by that is focus on what they're learning and not necessarily what you're teaching. Sometimes we get so caught up in our teaching style that we don't realize that what we're doing is not really connecting with the child. Your child's spiritual growth depends on what they hear more than on what you say. 
that's not always the same thing. We say something, we think, okay, the child got it. No, each child is different. And if you've raised more than one child and I've raised three, if you raise more than one, you know every single one is different and they hear things differently. Jesus was the master teacher. And so let's look at Matthew chapter 13 as Jesus shares something I think is, is very relevant and important to the way that we teach. Nobody did it better than Jesus. Jesus taught with parables. And this was puzzling to the disciples. And they ask, why do you use parables in verse 10 of chapter 13? Here's his reply, verse 11. Jesus answered them, to you... It has been granted to know the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven, but to them it has not been granted. Now I want to explain something about the phrase kingdom of heaven. Kingdom of heaven appears 32 times in the Bible. Every single time it's in the book of Matthew. He's the only writer in the Bible to use the phrase kingdom of heaven. When Matthew uses the phrase kingdom of heaven, he doesn't mean heaven. He means the kingdom of the people that belong to God who are subject to the king, who are going to heaven. So he's talking here about the church. The church has been granted to you to know the mystery of the church, the kingdom of heaven. But to them, it has not been granted. He's talking about his enemies, the Pharisees and the scribes and the Sadducees, who would be in his audience constantly trying to catch him in what he was saying to say something wrong. And so he would teach in these parables because he says, some, you, you already are, are knowing the mystery of the kingdom of heaven, but they're not. Verse 12, for whoever has, to him more shall be given, and he will have an abundance. But whoever does not have, even when he has, shall be taken away from him. He's saying, I'm staying in such a way that the some are getting it and some are not. And it's really, it's genius how Jesus did this. Verse 13, therefore, I speak to them in parables because while seeing, they do not see. And while hearing, they do not hear, nor do they understand. I didn't understand that verse for a long time, but, but I've, I've come to understand now that what Jesus is doing here is he is saying it in such a way that his word will make the connection in the mind. The parables aren't complicated. You've read them. They're not difficult to understand but you have to have a spiritual mind. You have to be seeking the kingdom in order to really understand it. Those who weren't seeking, they got absolutely nothing out of his message, which is brilliant. We want our children to get much out of our message. So we have to think about what connects in their mind, what gets this point across to them. And then that's what we do. So focus on their learning rather than on your teaching. Next thing we want to do with children is nurture our child's natural hunger for God's Word. Children are born with a natural hunger to understand eternity and the God who created them and while they're here. Ecclesiastes chapter 3 verse 11 says that. God has set eternity in the hearts of men. And so each child is born with that. And so because of that, if you will place the Word of God before your child, they will feast on its wisdom. I'm not exaggerating. Try it. Just get the Word of God in front of a child and they are just, they'll gobble it up and say, here's what God's Word says. Oh, really? The God who created? This is what He thinks. This is how He feels. They want to know that. Read the Bible with your children and then discover what is the best method for your child, because each one is different, that helps them to mature in their faith? Some children are more audio. They have to hear it. And once they hear it a few times, okay, now I've got it. Some are more visual. They have to see it. Some learn by repetition. Maybe you want to memorize some scriptures with your child. Teach them to do that. Challenge that and to go over and over again. Read it several times. Repetition. Some are hands-on. They have to have things that they're doing. And once they move the little pieces around or something, then they get it better. Some learn more through singing. Songs are a great way to teach the Word of God. And there are many wonderful songs written from the Word of God. Learn those songs together with your children. There's lots of different ways to express that. And then once you figure out how your child learns best, I think it'd be a good idea to talk to your Bible class teacher or your child's Bible class teacher 
about how each individual child learns? Be a great idea. That'd be valuable information to them so they can also teach your child in a greater way. Romans chapter 10, let's look at that verse. We're trying to get the Word of God in front of people because the Word of God is how our faith grows. That's what Romans chapter 10 says. Look together with me at verse 14. It says, How then will they call him whom they have not believed? How will they believe in him whom they have not heard? How will they hear without a preacher? How will they preach unless they are sent? Just as it is written, How beautiful are the feet of those who bring the good news of good things. However, they did not all heed the good news. For Isaiah says, Lord, who has believed our report? Here's the key, verse 17. So faith comes from hearing and hearing by the word of Christ. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of Christ. When we hear the word of Christ or the word of God, that's how faith comes about. And so when they know the Word of God, when you instill the Word of God in your child, then they have the most essential tool for growing in their faith. Get the Word of God in front of your child, and that's how they're going to grow in their faith. All right, uh, last point here. With your child, when it comes to your child, make worship as enjoyable as possible. Now, here's why I say that. How many of you have ever talked to somebody that you're trying to get to church and they just won't go? And you say, well, why don't you come to church? And they say something very similar to this. When I was young, my parents made me go. Have you heard that before? I <laughs> can't tell you how many times I've heard that. What do they mean their parents made them go? Made them go? Well, what they're saying is church was a drudgery. It meant fussing around Sunday morning trying to get ready. It was a hassle getting there. They couldn't wait to leave. They had to sit on those little hard pews, their little faces facing forward all the time. If they tried to turn their heads, parents would grab their little heads and turn it back. They got the, the spit bass from mom. I mean, it was, it was a horrible experience for them. It was dull. It was uneventful. You know, really, does church have to be a miserable experience for our children? Jesus didn't design the church like that. That's our doing when we, we make it uh, less than the joyful experience that it was intended for. Going back to the book of Matthew, when Jesus was explaining about the kingdom again, the kingdom of heaven, and he uses that phrase again in Matthew 22, it's another one of the 32 times that he uses this. And starting in verse 1, it says, Jesus spoke to them again in parable, saying, The kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who gave a wedding feast for his son. Now think about the times that Jesus wrote this in. A wedding feast was the greatest event that you could attend. There was nothing more thrilling, more exciting than a wedding feast. And so when we as Christians get together to worship the king, it should be a joyful, it should be like a great wedding feast. It should be a great time. Your child needs to learn how to enjoy worshiping God. And you are the best one, first of all, to set the example, and I hope you are doing that first but then teach them why this is such a joy to you. Instill that in it. Commend your child when they participate in the singing and the prayer. And when they do act up, I understand you want your child to, to uh, not be disruptive, but when they, they act up, think about what you're going to do and how we use what we call the cry room. You know, the cry room should be a teaching tool, not a playtime. Kids are pretty smart. And they figure out, okay, if I act up in church, I get to go back in that room and play. Well, when they figure that out, what are they going to do? They're going to act up. If you take them to the cry room and use that as a place, say, okay, now we're going to sit 
hear. And I, I love it when there's even a pew in the cry room where they can sit and they can still hear the lesson and they can hear the singing and they can participate, but they're not disrupting those around them. That's a great way to use the cry room because I know we have visitors, their kids are not used to sitting still during a service. That's understandable. They can use the cry room too to teach their child. You don't want your child to be unruly, distracting. I get that. But can you allow them a little leeway to move around, maybe to turn and observe others? And then say, isn't that neat? Everybody's worshiping God. People excited to be here. Find ways to make church service a positive experience for your child. We are trying to get our kids to graduate out of Imitating faith. Imitating faith is where I, they don't understand, they just do what you do. And it's not an overnight experience, obviously. Neither is physical growth. Spiritual growth is the same. It takes time. But teaching your children about God is one of the most important jobs we have in the Lord's church. These young souls are so precious. And if we want them to carry on the Lord's work after we're gone, we must show them that Christianity is a gift that they can treasure for a lifetime. Help your child to graduate from imitating faith. In our next class, I want to show you how to recognize affiliating faith. The first level is imitating faith. The next level is, is affiliating faith, or imitating faith and then affiliating faith. So in affiliating faith, that's where I understand, but I'm still just doing it because others do that. I've shown you already how to recognize that in yourself, but how do you recognize that in other people? I'll show you what the telltale signs are that somebody that you're trying to work with may have affiliating faith. Really hope that you will be here for that class. Thank you so much for your attention. We'll see you next time.